It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 230 of Science on Top for Sunday the 12th of June 2016. I'm Ed Brown and today I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And the owner of Aquariums to Go, Brisbane's finest aquarium maker and fish expert, Phil Kent. Welcome back. Thank you, Ed. And a wildlife biologist and founder of the Darwin Skeptics, welcome to the show, Michelle Franklin. Thanks, Ed. Hi. Now, Michelle, before we started, you told me that your job title is really weed scientist, which I can only assume means you're the Walter White of marijuana. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> it. Yep. We will have a lot more to say after the show then. <laughs> but um, yeah, No, just to be clear, I'm uh, working on invasive plants, not, well, I guess the other ones could be invasive if you did it right, but yeah, I'm working on killing them less so than growing them. Well, that's kind of why we've got you on the show today, because the last few episodes we've been talking a bit about biological controls, like introducing a form of herpes into rivers to wipe out the invasive carp. And the more famous example here in Australia, obviously, is introducing cane toads in order to wipe out the cane beetle. And we've had a bit of back and forth with you on this, because we, I think, were trivialising it a little bit. But I wanted to hear from you on the show. Uh, what exactly are we using these biological controls for? Are they purely to wipe out invasive species or is it a bit more complicated than that? No, well, it's it's a fairly simple goal. Biocontrol in the way that we do it now is to reduce numbers. So it's not meant to wipe anything out. It's designed to basically create a bit of a balance when you get a, an invasive plant or animal or, or something come into an area where it doesn't normally exist, it comes by itself. So it doesn't have all of its normal pathogens that act on it in its natural environment. So if you get, I mean, I'm working with plants. So if you get a plant in Central America, which is where most of our weeds come from, it'll be covered in caterpillars and fungus and all sorts of beetles and things like that that are eating it and killing its seeds and destroying its flowers and it's adapted to to handle that kind of load on its systems. And when it comes to Australia and all of those animals don't exist here, it suddenly thrives and it grows out of control and it spreads and that's why these invasive plants become weeds because they just don't have that... Yeah, they don't have those agents acting against them. So biocontrol is basically bringing in its natural predators to just bring it back to a normal level where it's the same as all the other plants around it, where it's not going to get this massive advantage that Mm -hmm. it currently has. But when you say bringing in its natural predators and things, uh, isn't that kind of compounding the problem? Is that you're then bringing in something else that is from a different no. environment that might also no, so run wild? No, so it could be if you didn't do it right. And that's where we've had examples like the cane toad where it went horribly wrong in the past where they just haven't planned it out properly. So, I mean, there, there's different forms of biocontrol. The, the most common one that is used all the time is the broad spectrum one, which is basically an animal that will eat all sorts of different things you let it into an environment and you expect it to eat all sorts of different things. And nowadays we just call that grazing. So like a cow, a cattle farm is sort of a form of biocontrol because the cows will eat pretty much most things. But cane toads were kind of in that category because they're not specialists. They're not going to just eat the cane beetle. They're going to eat mm-hmm. whatever they find. And if the cane beetle's not easy, they'll just go eat something else and they'll spread and become a problem. And so, that was the problem, wasn't it? The cane beetle used to crawl up high on the um, sugar canes where the toads couldn't get them. So they went for more Yeah, well, that's it. just not where they feed. Cane toads just eat on the ground. They eat things that walk past them and cane beetles don't walk past them, so they don't eat them. 
But these days, the, the form of biocontrol that we do here in Australia is just the classical biocontrol where you take one animal out of its natural environment and you spend a couple of years testing it. So you'll do two kinds of tests. Well, first of all, you'll, you'll look at the kind of uh, plants that it can live on. So you'll look at, uh, first of all, you'll look at the, the one species that it's found on, then you'll look within its genus, and then you'll look within its family, and you'll kind of work out which plants it's likely to survive on, which plants have similar uh, kind of leaves, similar kind of nutrients in them, what kind of things these insects need. And then you work out, sometimes it'll only be 20 or 30 plants, and sometimes it'll be over 100 different species. And then you'll run two sorts of trials. So you'll do exclusive trials where you put the insect in a cage with that tree and wait and see what happens. And the insect either survives, does a full life cycle and reproduces, or it dies. And mm. that's sort of a way of saying it can or it can't survive on this plant. And then the other one is you'll do selection trials where you'll put it in a cage with two different plants and see which one it chooses. And you spend a couple of years just making sure that these insects can't live without their host weed so they're completely dependent on on the weed that you're trying to eradicate or not sorry not trying to eradicate they're completely dependent on the weed that you're trying to control right. so they can't be a problem to anybody else or any other plant species fair enough and yeah they can't impact on anything else so i guess it's the sort of thing that it, it, it needs many years of testing and trials before we can actually say yes this is something we want to go ahead with like this obviously yeah. this carp thing that the her introducing herpes mm. into the murray darling river is something that we've looked at extensively in small controlled areas i assume um i yeah i'm not familiar with with viruses or um or how that works but yep. Anything that they're going to introduce, they will have done these tests. They will have taken all the different fish species that are even close to being able to uh, carry this disease and they will have exposed them to it to see if it can survive on them and whether it can infect them, whether it can be carried by them. They will have tested all of these things before they even consider releasing it. Right. Um, and this might be, again, outside your um, area of expertise. You might not know this specifically, but... If the cane toad is now such a problem and such a pest, are there biological controls that we're looking at in order to contain the cane toads? Is there yeah, definitely. an insect, a, a marsupial, a, a something that will attack cane toads only? There's a worm at the moment that has been fairly extensively studied over the last sort of five or ten years that infects the, the cane toad's lungs and it basically makes them not very strong. It makes them come out of the water like when they turn from a tadpole into a a toad they're smaller they're stunted they're not very capable and they just don't thrive as well mm -hmm. and it it was discovered in australia and the idea was you know maybe we could sorry it was discovered in south america and the idea was maybe we can introduce this to australia but then we found there's already one in australia it's a different version of this same worm and it's already spreading throughout australia and it is already impacting on them. So the idea was to maybe release this worm and maybe it still will be, but it has actually already found its way here without human intervention. I don't know how it got here. Maybe it was in the toads when they first came. Um, maybe it came from native populations here, but there is already the, like a, an Australian version of this worm in, in the wild populations. Very cool. So it's already happening. Yeah, and then there's other um, methods. So another method of uh, biocontrol is called conservative control, which is basically trying to get your natural predators and increase their numbers. So what one person was doing was looking at trying to get the meat ants to come down to the edge of the water. So she was training them with cat food, um, getting them to come down to the edge of the water. And then while they were there, they were then attacking the cane toad metamorphs as they were coming out of the water. So there's all sorts of things like that that you can use. And there's less risk in those because you're not actually introducing a new thing. So you don't have to do mm. as much, you know, host specificity native. training and that sort of thing. Yeah. 
sorry, uh, what's a meat ant? <laughs> Am I the only one who hasn't sorry, heard of this? Local term. I, I don't know what their their Latin name is, but it's like a uh, a little sort of red and black ant. They're probably about a centimetre long. They look a lot like a bull ant, but they don't put venom into you. So when they bite you, it just hurts a lot. And then you just brush them off and it doesn't hurt anymore. So they're basically, they they kill with their teeth rather than with venom. But they're really common around here. I'm forever trying to get them out of my backyard. Oh, lovely. And they eat meat. Well, so we call them meat ants. There, with there goes my holiday in names. Darwin. Uh, if, if, if that's a problem, if the ants are what are worrying you, maybe you shouldn't <laughs> come to Darwin. Fair point. Well, stay away from Australia, the ant. really. What was that, Phil? You don't want to visit the big ant? <laughs> uh, if that's a euphemism for something, I don't <laughs> want to know. But, uh, no, let's let's move on, I think. <laughs> just, a, a, just a point with the carp virus. Uh, from memory, I think that appeared spontaneously in carp farms in Israel. I could be wrong on that point. But it's only been observed in carp from uh, the reading I did some time ago. Mm. So they'll, even before well, they brought it in... And presumably they've to, done lots of tests uh, with other fish that are in there. Exactly. So even before they brought it in, they were pretty confident that it was only going to stick with the, the carp. Yeah. Sorry, Penny, did you have something you wanted to say? I was just wondering, Michelle, because I teach science in high school and it's usually only the biological control failures that make the textbooks, which is, I think, why a lot of people have such a negative impact of it because all they hear of is, you know, cane toads and maybe, if you're lucky, Khaleesi virus or myxomatosis. What's an example of a success story? Classic example is Cactoblastus cactorum. I think you mentioned it. A couple of weeks ago, it was a huge success. Um, oh, is this a prickly pear? So it's a pear. little moth, yeah, uh, released in the 1920s. Um, it's a perfect example of what's supposed to happen. Myxomatosis and Khaleesi both were also success stories. A lot of the stories that people put out there and say that they're failures, they're actually mm. successes because we're not aiming to eradicate. We're aiming mm-hmm. to reduce the pressure and – sorry, increase the pressure and reduce the advantage – and bring numbers under control. So that's what the cactoblastis mm. did, that's what myxomatosis did, and that's what Khaleesi did. They brought the numbers down, and then if you want to eradicate, what, what you're going to do is easier. use the biocontrol to bring things down to a manageable level, and then you go in with your herbicides, with your fire regimes, and with your mm-hmm. physically going in and cutting trees down and poisoning the stumps. But the biocontrol brings things down to mm-hmm. to that level where it's manageable, and most of the the big ones like that have worked very well. And the ones that have failed, we don't hear about because, yeah. like, there was one a few years ago where they took these gorgeous little beetles out into Catherine to control the bellyache bush, and they released them, and every beetle flew in a different direction, and they never saw each other again. So, <laughs> oh. like, that's. That's a biocontrol failure. The mm. cane toads don't happen again. What happens now is a failure means that nothing happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you can get lists of them. The CSIRO does a lot of it. If you look on their website, they've got a few listed there. One of the ones that is listed on there is the uh, UU, which is a moth um, called UU Pathesia cisplatensis, which I'm very proud that I can say that. It took me a couple of weeks. <laughs> I was really but- impressed. <laughs> I, I know that because that's the moth that I'm working on at the moment, mm. and right. it's been very successful. It's been released uh, for the last few years. It's out uh, in the wild on the Parkinsonia on the Parkinsonia infestation. So we've got 3.4 million hectares of Parkinsonia in Australia, and we've got Which this is moth on a it. Plant, I assume, a weed. Yes, it's it's a tree, a oh. very weedy tree. It's very pretty. It's like a thorny tree with these beautiful yellow flowers. And it spreads and it's really horrible for the cattle. They can't walk through it and, yeah, it's difficult to control. But these moths are doing really well. They're laying their caterpillars on it. The caterpillars eat it. So the moths themselves don't do any harm, but the caterpillars eat it really well. And they're spreading, they're surviving. And just this year we've just released another moth which doesn't have a species name yet. It's been... Uh, tested by Syro have been doing all of the testing to make sure that it's safe and they've finally given it the okay and we released it this year 
and we don't know if it's working yet, but it's very closely related to the UU. We've called it UU2 because it doesn't have a its own name yet. We Apparently there was debate about calling it U2, but that got a bit too no. confusing, so it's UU2. <laughs> Um, uh, and it's basically the same moth, but from a slightly warmer environment. So it, it's from a, a, nor- a more northern part of Argentina. So it's probably a little bit more suited to the conditions up here. So it's already been released in Queensland, in NT, and I think probably Western Australia by now as well. And uh, they're doing really well. And that's like two weeks ago, I was out releasing them and monitoring them. So that's definitely very current. And you were talking before about how you don't necessarily want to eradicate things, you just want to cull their numbers. It's not that we don't want to, it's just that it's way too hard. Right, so that's not Um, the prime goal of biological control. But in most cases, I would imagine if something is a pest and an invasive species, you'd want to eradicate it completely if it wasn't there. Oh, definitely. Right. It comes down to the feasibility. So you look at the amount of energy you put into control and the amount of benefit and if something can't be eradicated, you're not going to waste your resources trying. So something that can't be eradicated, you look at trying to contain it, you look at trying to protect specific sites. So if you have a particular waterway that has an endangered species in it or has some cultural significance, you'll target that area for control work. Um, with some of the grasses, you'll target the built-up areas because they pose a fire risk. So mm-hmm. where the risk is high, you'll put the effort in. And, yeah, we could spend millions on trying to rec- trying to control some weeds and you just wouldn't get anywhere. So you're better off putting those millions into trying to control the weeds that you can control. So, like, we have yeah. one weed up here that is only existing in one small river. So that one's marked for eradication and we are pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars into killing that one weed because it's possible. Ah, Fair enough. All right, let's move on. And Phil, uh, let's talk about how fish can be trained to recognise human faces, which is pretty cool. Okay, so we're talking about archer fish. They're from North Queensland and go up into South Asia. They can be quite popular in the, the aquariums, which is where I know them from, and they're renowned for their archery skills. So they shoot water from their mouths to shoot bugs off of plants into the water for their dinner. Wow. I I reckon that's pretty awesome. They are. They're really cool creatures in themselves, which is one of the reasons they're popular in in fish tanks. Um, So these scientists from the University of Oxford and the University of Queensland have trained archer fish to recognise a human face. They spit the face, then they get a food reward. Then (laughs) comes the cool part. They started adding other human faces to the mix and only rewarded the fish when they shot the right face. And surprisingly, they got up to 86% accuracy. Not what you expect from a fish. No. Do you know how many faces they presented to the fish? There's, I think, I want to say 40-something, but I think that's too high. I read 40. Yeah. Okay, we'll go with 40. (laughs) There's and was it just the one there. fish or was it several fish? Uh, there was multiple fish. The, the highest got the 86% accuracy and, and some did much poorer. Oh, I see. Right. But this is the sort of uh, facial recognition you expect from primates, not from fish. People that keep fish as pets, they probably argue that they know that their fish knows who they are. But that's obviously anecdotal, so... Having science come in and, and test a fish that, that, quite honestly to me, is unexpected to have this ability. The smarter fish tend to be the, the higher-end predators, things that are stalking larger fish and, and whatnot, if that makes sense. It does, and uh, it reminds me, uh, I don't know if Penny, you remember this, but not long ago we talked about birds that can recognise humans. Mm. Uh, I think they were like in Iceland magpies. or something. Yeah, yeah. and magpies uh, too, I think. Mm. Yeah. Well, they were comparing the results to um, the level of, of birds. Yeah. So that's really quite quite surprising. Well, especially, I mean, we don't tend to think of fish as being all that intelligent. I mean, well, you might not. Obviously, there's <laughs> limits in how you can measure intelligence, I guess, with a fish. But the whole the myth about the goldfish with a 30-second memory or three-second memory, whatever it is, which is yeah. plainly and demonstrably false. Tries I might. They, they can't get Sudoku, though. 
<laughs> well, it's very hard for them to hold the pen in their mouths like that and to write on the paper. Anyway. Yeah, pencil, Ed, underwater. You can't use a pen underwater. Jeez. <laughs> oh, look, I'm sure NASA spent millions inventing a pencil that can, a pen that can write underwater. Anyway. That's right. Go down that road. <laughs> It's very cool, but it's just archer fish. They haven't done the test on any other species of fish? or Not yet. I guess the archer fish are a good one because they can exhibit a very accurate behaviour or accurately yep. testable behaviour and repeatable behaviour, whereas a lot of other fish, that's probably a lot more difficult. I suppose you yeah. could train them to... I think to, you could to... get most fish to kind of swim up to a picture. Yeah, put a different picture on the left hand or the right hand side of the tank and see which one they, they swim up to. I suppose. Yeah. Or the get them to I swim in a circle. These... Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you get them to swim in a circle when they recognise a certain face or something. And, and counterclockwise when they don't recognise it. Yeah. Sorry, Michelle. Oh, the question that I had about these fish, I don't know how smart they are, but I assume if they are shooting things out of the sky, they must have reasonably good eyesight. Mm. And I'm just trying to envision these fish, like, looking at a picture of a face and aiming at it. And I'm wondering if they're not actually seeing a face. Like, if they're honing in on some tiny aspect, like, you know, the corner of the nose or the the shape of the eye or some really small mm. part that they might be adapted. Like, if they normally hunt a cricket, they mm. would be looking at some tiny little thing. And then if you look at a different picture of a face where that tiny little thing is different... I wonder yeah. if it's not really facial recognition, but it's just that these fish are really good at seeing tiny, tiny details and, and yeah, fixating on one on small pattern. thing. Nose recognition. <laughs> yeah, something like that. They have some fish at the local wildlife park right near where I live here that because we have archer fish in the rivers here and they've trained them to spit for a hand signal so the they do displays and a person will walk out and they'll do a hand signal and the fish will spit at their hand and then they'll give them some food and they'll actually like they'll go behind a person and they'll do the hand signal behind the person's head and get the fish to spit them in the face <laughs> it's all part of the show good fish very cool but, oh that's that, interesting that's how i wash my hands normally so, <laughs> <laughs> so i'm just question, glad you know man. you do wash occasionally phil <laughs> It's okay, he's not biting around. <laughs> <laughs> but the question then is, can they be taught to react to different hand signals? Can you essentially teach them a rudimentary sign language then? Oh, but, my God. <laughs> well, they don't have hands, so... It'll no, but be they can language. read it. They can't necessarily talk it. Ah. Uh. All right. Uh, well, Penny, last week a woman in Pennsylvania tested positive to a rare kind of E. coli infection. This is a superbug that's resistant to most antibiotics, including colostin, which is usually the last resort, mm. the last line of defence against uh, E. coli. And, of course, the fear from this is that it could be the start of a widespread outbreak, and obviously we've discussed the looming danger of antibiotic resistance before. Marin McKenna, the author of the excellent book Superbug, has written an article for National Geographic about why it's actually important that this was discovered in a urinary tract infection. Uh, and I didn't realise just how common UTIs were, but how little, I guess, um, the, how little protocol has gone into treating them with respect to antibiotic resistance. Yeah, I found that really fascinating because I have to confess even though I know superbugs are very important, you get a bit of fatigue reading again and again, oh, a new bacteria, it's resistant. And this was an angle I just hadn't thought of. And UTIs are very, very common in women. I think the article I read by Marilyn suggested I think 8 million, million, million women in the US a year, or I'm guessing women, I'm, it's men can get them as well, but they're just more common in women, will have yeah. one. So that's a huge number of infections which are usually treated with antibiotics sometimes doctors will culture it to see which antibiotic to give but often they just say oh it's a uti mm. have this one you know have a broad if it doesn't spectrum. work yeah. have another one yeah. and if it doesn't you know and this re um, infection that was found was resistant to pretty much everything so i thought the first thing i thought that was interesting is well yeah why is there no 
sort of accepted protocol or data collection based on UTIs. And I guess it's because they're seen, even though they're very painful and troubling, they're seen as very routine and treatable, just one of those things that happens to women. And because it's only happening to women, not to everyone, maybe it doesn't make the press, I guess. Yeah, maybe it's not uh, seen in the same significance by a lot of the mostly male Mm. uh, professionals in this area, I guess. But, yeah. Which which is interesting because, and also I guess it also, they don't seem to have that epidemiological thing. Like it's not like you catch it from someone else. It's not an STD. Mm. It, it just, you know, it just, hap- not just happens, but you know what I mean? It's not contagious. Yeah. The other thing that's fascinating is how, where are these strains coming from? And there's two sort of schools of thought, which I think both have stakeholders in. So I'm just going to present without comment, but (laughs) (laughs) one is antibiotic use in agriculture. And this is because this is for a variety of reasons to promote growth Mm. or because animals are living in such horrendous conditions that essentially they need antibiotics to prevent them from getting sick because they're living in conditions that are genuinely going to make them get sick. And poultry, chicken and stuff is often the worst for spreading that back to humans perhaps so once a superbug develops in a animal population and you know the animals eventually are slaughtered and become our meat and we handle them with you know with our hands as we cook and you know you forget to wash your hands you don't wash your hands properly you who knows what happens and they enter the human system there's another school of thought which is that you know it can go the other way from humans to animals so we're being overprescribed antibiotics for all sorts of things and those resistant bacteria leave our bodies, they get flushed into waterways, into land and are shared with animals and so that's how they get to the animal populations. Look, I'm not... Yeah. You know. I would have thought that I'm in developed countries gonna... there's less of the raw sewage going into waterways and mm. things like that. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture Mm. also found a strain of the colostin-resistant E. coli in a sample of pig intestine. So uh, there's definitely it's related to the animals somehow, whether or not it's from humans to animals or animals to human or possibly even both, you know. And that's the thing. It probably is both. And it also probably doesn't really matter in the end because I think we, we need to take action both at the human level and at the animal level. But it is fascinating because the fact that it was in a UTI means that these new resistant antibiotics could, if they're, you know, entering into human populations and, you know, if being found in feces and that's what, you know, that can cause a UTI, then there's going to be more and more and more people mostly women, experiencing these UTIs and ex- being treated with stronger and stronger antibiotics and maybe receiving no relief, no cu- cure. Mm. And that is actually really dangerous. A UTI itself is painful and awful, but it, you know, it doesn't affect your life. But these infections can spread to the bladder and the kidneys and then into the bloodstream where they can be fatal if they're not mm. treated and can't be treated. So it's it's sort of a sleeper problem that could become quite serious. I can tell you from experience that mm. that, that happened to me. I had a UTI yeah. and I, for some reason it wasn't painful, so mm. I didn't know. And I waited three days because oh I thought I had God. food poisoning. I, I mean, there was oh. no pain and I just mm. felt sick. And it took me three days before I got to the point where I couldn't walk. Mm. And I thought, okay, well, that's not right. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't even crawl across the floor. So I got to the doctor and they tested me and they said, oh, you have a kidney infection. It was three days of a UTI to the point where I couldn't walk anymore. And then they gave me antibiotics and the next day I was better. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I I don't want to think what would have happened if those antibiotics weren't an option. But the other thing, of course, is clearly if you have a UTI, you want to get it tested and you want to find out what bacteria you've got and use the correct antibiotic for that rather than just take a broad spectrum and get rid of anything that's there. 
But of course, that takes time, and it takes time to get pathology say, results back. By the time and you've to, gone, yeah. oh, maybe this is actually something. Maybe the cranberry juice isn't working. Mm. Maybe I will go to the doctor. Oh, I can't get an appointment today, so I'll go tomorrow. And then you know, yeah, they take the culture, they send off, and you want you want something, yeah, right away, right away. But, uh, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, Wipe from uh, front to back and uh, drink your cranberry <laughs> juice and it doesn't happen to you, I guess. Isn't it? Drink lots of water. Uh, that also, and uh, when, when prescribed with antibiotics for anything, I guess, the key is to ask the doctor how necessary is it and does it have to be broad spectrum? Is there a specific one that you can try? I think it's, it's antibiotic resistance is one of those things where everyone involved needs to take steps to try and cut back, mm. you know both the agricultural industry to doctors who overprescribe, you know, for everything that's wrong, have antibiotics, see if that helps type thing. And particularly people who have a viral infection and take antibiotics because that's not going to work. Yep. But something to, to watch out And taking out for. half a course and stopping because uh, you feel better. You feel better. Yeah, that's right. Check whether or not you need to continue the whole course or whether you can stop whenever you feel better. Consult your doctor. I find that really scary, though, when the doctor says, oh, this box is for X tablets, but you only need to take such and such. And I think, really? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> well, no, there, there's also there's the school of thought that, that goes the other way around, that because yeah. we're having these full courses, even when they're not maybe necessary, is that we're still introducing the toxins into the system and the bacteria is still going to develop resistance to them because we're mm. using so much. Mm. So it's one of those things, who's right, who's wrong? Yeah. Check your doctor. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, they're more up to date with it than I am. Uh, do not can take anything we say on this podcast as medical <laughs> advice. Definitely not. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> One person who does know what she's talking about a lot of the time is Michelle Franklin, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And where can people find you on the internet? Oh. Well, more to the point, is there anything you want to plug? Oh, you know what? <laughs> We what? have a Facebook group for the Darwin Skeptics. Uh, it's a public group, so anyone can join. If you live anywhere near Darwin, like within a thousand kilometres, please join. Um, our, our meetings are very small at the moment, so anybody, if if you live far away but you happen to be coming through Darwin, we'll have a meeting for you. <laughs> so look yeah. us up on Facebook. It's uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. Say hello. Excellent. Come say hello, have a drink. Uh, I'm sure I'd be more than happy to go down the pub and talk to some like-minded folks. Excellent. Definitely. Uh, did you want to also talk about the Gorilla Skeptics of Wikipedia? Sure. Oh, what's um, that? I joined, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my. Not that kind I of I joined Gorilla, gorilla Skeptics a couple of years ago now and highly recommend if anybody wants to get involved, um, look them up. They're, they're everywhere. There's, um, a Facebook thing. There's a email thing. There's a YouTube thing. There's, there's all sorts of links everywhere. Just look them up. We should say Gorilla Skeptics, uh, is basically the idea is that because Wikipedia is the go-to place for a lot of information, uh, a lot of the opponents of skeptics, like uh, your anti-vaccinationists, your homeopaths, your conspiracy theorists, they will often try and edit the pages of well-known skeptics, for example, and to discredit them and put in things that are not true. So the guerrilla skeptics of Wikipedia basically go in and keep an eye on well-known skeptics pages or topics that are often attacked to keep them in line. And they also will write pages for notable skeptics or skeptical topics and in fact michelle is the reason why science on top is on wikipedia uh, oh i did that i you did, did. Uh, <laughs> for the australian skeptics there's a list of australian skeptical podcasts and michelle put us in there and uh, we're very grateful Yay. for that it makes us feel like we're important <laughs> Yay. And, and you can see how strong my memory is too because i totally remember doing that yes yeah that was a few years ago it's okay the other thing that the guerrilla skeptics do is they they have this little group of people that are ready to respond. So when something's happening, if if somebody's just made a change on some page and said something that's blatantly wrong or could cause damage, there's like an instant response. Somebody will say, "Hey, look, somebody said this," and whoever's awake at the time will will jump on it and and it'll be a real time kind of battle of between. 
you know, the bad people and the good people. Uh, and and because and it's such a worldwide group, there's always somebody awake and there's always a few people there ready to respond to this misinformation that's going out on Wikipedia. And they're also really friendly and helpful. So if you've never edited a Wikipedia page before, don't worry. They'll walk you through it. They'll tell you what you need to look out for and how to make sure that it gets uh, onto Wikipedia and doesn't get discredited or whatever. So check them out. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes and uh, hopefully a few more people will join and keep, keep up the good fight. But Phil Kent, it's always great to have you on the show. Where's the best place to find you on the internets? On the internet, my alter ego, Skeptimite, has a <laughs> Facebook page now. So you could always look there, Skeptimite on Twitter, or even better, you could go to the Brisbane Skeptics Facebook group where I lurk. And uh, has the Brisbane Skeptics got anything coming up? Is there a Skepti Camp, I believe? It just so happens to be a Skepti Camp coming up in August 6th and 7th. What does that and, involve? Well... Speakers under the age of 18 are especially welcome this year with awards being given for epic presentations. We're doing this over two days and we're going to have some special speakers. Not going to tell you who yet because we don't know, but we've got some, some irons in the fire. We're going to have a really <laughs> good uh, Skeptic Camp this year. So basically Skeptic Camp, anyone can come and talk about a topic of their interest? That's right. Yes, Excellent. check it out. Uh, on the, the Facebooks, have a look up for Skepticamp 2016. And we'll have a link to that, of course, in our show notes and links to all the stories that we talked about today at scienceontop.com slash 230, where you'll also find our social media links. You can leave a comment on the show. Uh, you can also email us, feedback at scienceontop.com, and you can always leave us a review on iTunes, just like CMY Review from the US did. They described us as intelligent and sceptical and said that I'm always trying to keep order on the show. Uh, personally, I think that's a Sisyphean task, so a lot of the time I don't bother. But uh, thank you. Uh, we do appreciate your reviews and feedback. It's very nice to know that there are people out there who actually listen and like what we do. Yay. And, of course, thank you so much, Penny. Oh, always a pleasure. This episode was edited with inventiveness and enthusiasm by Marcos Benemu. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Because scientists in India have discovered a new sex position for frogs. <laughs> it's true. Apparently, there are nearly 7,000 species of frogs out there, but until now, there have been only six known sex positions. The new frog sex position is called the dorsal straddle. <laughs> now, this one has to be done up against a rock or maybe the kitchen counter when the frog's roommate isn't home. <laughs> so that's it. That's the new position. For any of you unfamiliar with the other frog sex positions, those were also illustrated in the scientific study. So let's review. Again, <laughs> for science, number one, axillary, as froggy style. <laughs> number two, inguinal. That's ribbit for her pleasure. <laughs> Number three, cephalic. That's when you're going for axillary. We both had a long day at work. <laughs> Number four, glued. That's after one of you went out for dinner in an Indian buffet. <laughs> Number five, independent. That's when you're so tired from the first five positions that you just roll over and watch separate things on your phones. <laughs> and lastly, Number six, head straddle. Frogs. They're just like us.